Well, it is good to see everybody here today. For any visitors that we have with us this morning, I encourage you to fill out a visitor's card, which is in a small rack in the pew in front of you. At the end of our service, we're going to be uh, collecting those. All we want to do is get in touch with you and find out that you have any spiritual needs at all. And if you do have any spiritual needs, then we'd love to sit down and, and help you in any way that we can, whether it's through a, a Bible study or prayers, or if you understand the gospel and, and you need to obey, then don't delay any longer. Let us know what we can do to help you grow closer to God. This evening, Rebecca and I are going to be hosting a singing. If you did not receive the email about that in the family talk, uh, it's going to be at 7 o'clock at our house. If you'd like to have more information about that, just let me know or let Rebecca know afterward. 7 o'clock, we'll sing for an hour, an hour and a half or so, and you're more than welcome to stay as long as you'd like at our home this evening. So come and sing with us if you'd like to. Brian picked a very good song leading into the sermon this morning, The Way That He Loves. We're going to talk about love this morning as Christ also loved. We're going to be noticing from Ephesians chapter 5 in particular the lessons that we can learn about the marriage relationship and submission from the way that Jesus loves His bride, the church, and the way that He submitted to His bride's needs and the way that the bride submits to His authority. We all submit. Submission is not a feminine thing. It's not a masculine thing. It is an everybody thing. We all submit to various sources of authority, whether they're secular sources of authority like a government or they're in the context of a congregation where we submit to the needs of each other and submit to the authority of our elders here in our own congregation. But we also submit in marriage. Now, submission in marriage seems like a very old-fashioned kind of subject. In fact, some people just call it plain old outdated. That's one of the common objections, by the way, to the Bible. When you talk to skeptics of the Bible or modernists who do not like the way that marriage and love and submission is presented in the Bible, they'll often throw out the argument that typically goes something like this. Women in the Bible are usually treated like second-class citizens at best and mere property at worst. Concepts like submission and even marriage itself, some people might argue, simply have no place in a modern society where men and women are considered equal in every way. But I wonder, is this a fair accusation about the Bible and its presentation of women, marriage, and the term submission? Is the Bible nothing but a product of its time, a literary dinosaur with an obviously sexist agenda? Or is marital submission a key part of understanding the broader narrative of God's redemptive plan for mankind? Is marriage meant to convey the beauty and the empowerment that's found in spiritual marriage to Jesus Christ. That's what I would like to talk about today. But first, let's deal with some of these objections of how are women presented in the Bible, and is it a fair argument to say that the Bible just presents women as second-class citizens or as property at times? couple of bullet points to think about here. As much as the world might say so, the Bible, the Bible actually doesn't have the sexist agenda that it often claims. If anything, the Bible is revolutionary in its presentation of women as free moral agents, something that their contemporaries would not have considered. As presenting them as heroes, again, as many of their contemporaries would not have thought of them. As rich, layered purveyors of things like truth and kindness and goodness. Along the same lines, Adam and Eve, as they're presented in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, held equal spiritual value. And that's true of all men and women, especially as we understand it in a Christian context. In Galatians 3 and verse 28, it says, there's neither male nor female, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that in Christ Jesus, the line between male and female physically speaking, or socially speaking, or maritally speaking, is somehow disappeared. But in terms of spiritual value, of the way that God sees the soul of a woman and the soul of a man, Jesus died equally for both. And equally, they are held in high esteem and valued by God. 
Now, the reason why I say Adam and Eve were both held in equal spiritual esteem in God's eyes is because they were both given the same opportunities in the Garden of Eden. They were both given the same commandments in the Garden of Eden. They were both given the same chance to obey God. And when one or both of them failed in obeying God, they were held accountable to it. You notice that Eve is never treated in some way patronizingly. That when God looks at Eve, he doesn't pat her on the head and say, well, I didn't expect anything better from you anyway. No, in fact, he holds Eve just as responsible as Adam. And they're both excluded from the Garden of Eden at the end of Genesis chapter 3. To me, when I read Genesis 2 and 3, they are both seen as valuable to God, and they both had the same opportunities that, w- that were given to them by God, and they were disciplined by God. Neither one was treated in a patronizing fashion. Women are capable of just as much good or evil as men, and that is consistently presented in the Bible. They're neither scrubbed, squeaky clean in a patronizing manner, nor are they dragged through the mud. In fact, when you look at a lot of the main female characters of the Bible, we're not presented with kind of monolithic or very simplistic people. We are presented with very layered, very complicated people. What are we supposed to make of Eve? who had some incredible qualities and is the mother of us all, but also had some incredible spiritual failures. Sarah is the same way, who's regarded as an incredibly faithful individual in Hebrews 11, but struggled with her faith at times, and is presented in a very negative light in some of her stories in the book of Genesis. Rebecca is the same way, who preferred one of her children over the other. Miriam, the sister of Moses, who on the one hand is regarded as very faithful in some ways, but also had a real struggle when it came to her relationship to Moses and respecting his authority within the congregation of Israel. And there's a lot of other women in the Bible who are presented in the same way. And the fact that the Bible goes out of its way to show that women are not just one-note individuals, but that they have many qualities, both good and bad, to me, shows that the Bible regards them as equal to men in a lot of ways. Women can also be very courageous. Women like Deborah and Ruth and Esther. Of course, going into that story in Deborah, who's the one who ended up... Who's, who's the one who ended up sealing the fate of their enemies there in the book of Judges. But Jael, a housewife who just happened to know how to wield a hammer and a tent peg really well. But women can be quite courageous, especially when they're faced with the destruction of their families or their people. Jesus adored and respected the women in his wife, his mother in particular, but Martha and Mary and others. Some of his most supportive and devoted disciples were women. They were women. While the men in his life, his male disciples, ran away and were hiding, every one of them abandoned him the night that he was betrayed by Judas. Every one of them was hiding while Jesus was being crucified, except perhaps for John, who was there witnessing the cross. But where were the women in his life? They were weeping and mourning for him openly, publicly. Luke chapter 23, verse 27, and John 19, verse 25, both make note of the fact that the women who were disciples of his, they weren't hiding from Jesus when he was on the cross. They weren't afraid of what was going to happen to them, unlike his male disciples. But it was the women who were weeping openly, for Jesus as he was dying on the cross. These are very powerful points to consider here. Submission is not a feminine concept in the Bible, but it applies to all of us. While women do submit to their own husbands, and there's a context for that kind of submission, we all submit to various authorities, ultimately out of respect for God. I submit to the government because I respect God. I submit to the elders of this church because I respect God. I submit to a police officer because I respect God. We respect and submit to our bosses ultimately because we respect God. And we submit in a marriage to each other's needs because we respect God's authority. And there's several passages here on the screen that you can write down and consider in your own time. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says that the wife or the woman submits to her husband, but the man submits to Jesus, and Jesus even submitted to the Father. So even Jesus understood submission. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it talks about submission both in the context of marriage, but in the context of employment as well. 
In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, and in chapter 2 and verse 13, we submit to earthly authorities because we care what God thinks of us. We regard and we respect God, so we regard and we respect earthly authorities as well. So submission sometimes gets a bad rap as if submission is some kind of a four-letter word. But let's shift gears here a little bit into marriage specifically. Not just the word submission, but our relationship within marriage. And let's talk about the idea of the battle of wills that typically plays out. Let's go back to, to Genesis chapters 2 and 3, in fact, and talk a little bit more about Adam and Eve. When they first met each other, it was bliss, wasn't it? When, when Adam wakes up from his divine surgery and he feels one side of his ribs a little bit different than the other side, he sees something, something that he'd never seen before. And he's seen everything, by the way. He's seen the animals. He's given them names. He's seen the Garden of Eden. He's heard the voice of God giving him commandments. Those are all wonderful things. But he sees something after he wakes up that he's never seen before. And the first thing he, is he does is he busts out poetry at the end of chapter 2. You ever, you ever fallen in love so quickly that you just want to bust out poetry on the spot? Right, Jason? I know it. you got a soft spot, don't you? But that's the first thing he did. He sees Eve and immediately busts out poetry. And the text says that they were so comfortable with each other, that they were so at ease with each other, so innocent in their relationship that they were naked and completely unashamed. But then chapter 3 begins. A marriage that started off so blissfully because of sin is disrupted. And two wills start battling against each other. And that's the typical drama that we do see played out in a lot of marriages where we do start off so well in those first few years, the honeymoon phase if you want to call it that, but then we start to realize, after the honeymoon phase wears off, we start to realize, you know, this person commits sins. And this person has faults and failures. And this person sometimes doesn't always want to do everything that I want him or her to do. And we can get frustrated and angry. And the wills start fighting against each other. Now, when Eve was presented with the opportunity to sin, she sinned. And when Adam was presented with the opportunity to sin, he sinned. And a marriage that was once blissful, where they were naked and unashamed of that fact, turned into a marriage where they were hiding in the bushes, both from each other and from God. Literally, hiding in the bushes from each other and from God. And when God finds them hiding, he says, what are you up to right now? What happened in your marriage to where this condition changed somehow? Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you had something to be ashamed of right now? It was sin. Sin entered into the equation. And their relationship with each other, as well as their relationship with God, was disrupted and forever changed. Of course, not all conflicts that we have arise over sins, at least as we might see them. I would even go so far as to say that most of our arguments in our marriages are over matters of judgment or conscience, even trivialities, not sins. And I'll give you a few examples here, things to think about. Arguments over particulars of your sexual relationship. Things like how often or in what way are the specifics of that. How to spend money. Necessities versus luxuries, budgeting, my money versus your money, certain vices or habits that we may argue are perceived gray areas, though I'm not saying they are, I'm just saying that in a certain context we might argue they're gray, they're gray areas. Does your spouse smoke, social drinking, occasional dabbling in gambling, maybe language that pushes the boundaries a little bit, or wandering eyes. People dismiss these things as moral gray areas. And it's amazing how often these moral gray areas feel very black and white when they disrupt the unity in a marriage. Matters of judgment in parenting. How old, how old should our kids be before they start dating? How about scholastic expectations? Are we okay with a C plus or do we expect an A minus? Punishments or tolerance for mischievous behavior. These things can really disrupt a marriage, and they're not necessarily sinful things. At least all of them are not necessarily 
sinful things, but they can disrupt unity in a marriage. I wonder, if you think back, if you think back on the last argument that you had with your spouse, or think back on the most common arguments you have with your spouse, how often were they really that important? And by the way, I'm not dismissing when those arguments are really substantial, when, when there are things that can really destroy a marriage, serious things, sinful matters. I'm not dismissing them. I'm just saying more often than not, when did that argument really matter in the long run? When did it really matter? In marriage, it should never be about my will versus yours. It should never be about counting who has more wins and who has more losses or keeping score of indiscretions and bad judgment calls. After all, when was the last time I told you so made anybody's marriage better? Oneness and intimacy can never be achieved between competing interests. In the same way that as you watch a football game on TV, you can never have two teams that are trying to achieve the same thing. They're competing interests. They're butting heads, fighting with each other, battling against each other. My will versus yours. I want to win, and the only way I can win is if you lose. And if that's our perspective on marriage, don't be surprised when marriage falls apart around you. So let's have our Bibles up into Ephesians, chapter 20, uh, Ephesians 5, verse 22. We often start at this passage when striking up a conversation about the Bible's model for effective and happy marriages, and that's rightly so. It is a great passage on this subject. So notice here in Ephesians 5.22, we'll skip around just for the sake of time here, so I'll be reading what's up here on the screen. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Notice again there the connection between submission and ultimately it's to the Lord. We submit to various authorities because we respect God. And because we respect God, we will submit to other minor authorities. Again, governments, police officers, elders in a congregation, or to our mate in a marriage. I submit because I respect God. So wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he goes on to say, Husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. So it seems very clear in this passage that each partner in a marriage has some unique responsibilities and roles in that marriage. But I wonder how can people with such vastly different skills and vastly different needs possibly come together as one, or as verse 31 would put it. How can two different people become one flesh? How can you leave your father and mother and cling to your spouse as if it is your own body? That's very difficult because your spouse, emotionally, physically, social security number wise, is not you. And sometimes you want to do things that your spouse doesn't want to do. And sometimes your spouse wants to do things that you don't feel like doing at the time either. How can they become one? Maybe the more important question is, how do we move from being selfish and stubborn in our marriage, in our conflicts, to being submissive to each other. Now, one of the problems that we face here in dealing with this subject is, as soon as you start talking about submission as an everybody concept, some people get a little bit upset about that. In fact, that was what prompted this lesson, was somebody asked me a question for our monthly question and answer session. I felt like it was a big enough question that it warranted a bigger consideration, a bigger look. So this was one of your questions, by the way, for our monthly question and answer sermon, but I just felt like this was a bigger subject than that. But somebody had asked me recently about this very thing, about what is it and 
How do you thrive in a marriage where you feel like you are the second class member? Where you feel like you are less of a person in that marriage? Beaten down? Used, perhaps? And again, does the Bible present marriage as that? Where the man is the head and he's at the top and he's, get, he's got the head of the household tiebreaker vote in everything and you've got to do what I tell you because it says it right there on the page in the Bible. But then you start about submission as an everybody thing. That submission isn't a feminine concept, but submission is an everybody concept and that can be a little bit upsetting to people. I find it really interesting then that even in the context of Ephesians 5, we always start at verse 22 because it's the beginning of the paragraph talking about marriage. But look at the verse right before verse 22. Look at the verse right before it. And what does verse 21 say about submission? Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Or be submissive to one another in the fear of Christ. So isn't it interesting, in the very context of talking about wives being submissive to their husbands, the verse right before it says, actually, we all need to be submissive to each other. That's not an exclusively wife quality. I must be submissive to you. You must be submissive to me. We must all be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, we're submissive to each other in a congregational setting. That when one of you has a need, we rally around you and we submit to that need and take care of you. Of course, it also would include submission to our elders. But if Paul makes such a bold statement as to say, all of you, Christians, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, I think that would include husbands and wives in a two-way relationship. And while it is true that this contextually is speaking of Christians interacting with each other in general, if you and your wife are both Christians, if you and your husband are both Christians, you as Christians have to practice Ephesians 5 verse 21 with each other. Now this isn't the only passage that speaks to this. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter exhorts husbands to live in an understanding manner with their wives, going on to say that you must grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Now that's a great statement, isn't it? Grant her honor. Don't patronize her. Don't treat her like a second class Christian. You grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. She's a fellow heir of the grace of life. And in God's eyes, your wife is as valuable to Him as any other soul. You must grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 2, Paul wrote to Timothy that he should treat all Christian women as mothers and sisters in all purity. That's a great statement. And going back to our original text here in Ephesians 5, is it a stretch to say that Jesus Himself, though He is King of kings and Lord of lords, submitted to His bride? Did Jesus submit to the church, at least in one sense? Go back to the Gospel of John, and in John chapter 13, what great act did Jesus perform in that chapter that might be seen as very submissive, even demeaning? Jesus took his clothes off and dressed as a servant, washed his disciples' feet. Now, Peter and some of the other disciples, they were, they were aghast at that. that. That was so strange to them, Peter refused at first to even let Jesus wash his feet. But Jesus convinced him, you have to let me wash your feet. Now, later on in the chapter, he says, do you understand what I'm doing? Do you understand the meaning of this statement? You call me Lord and teacher, for so I am. And I, I've always appreciated the fact that as Jesus was in the context of a servant submitting to his disciples, submitting to their needs as if he was a servant, he says, I'm still the Lord and the teacher. Just because I'm submitting to your needs and washing your feet like a servant, that doesn't mean I'm any less the Lord and the teacher. I am still the Lord and the teacher. Serving doesn't make you less of a person. Serving doesn't make you less of a husband. Serving doesn't make you less of a wife. Serving does not make you any less of a human being or a man or a woman or anything else. Serving actually makes you more like Jesus Christ. And the more you serve, the more you start to understand 
Jesus in the spirit of how he lived. Because he goes on to say, after he served them, I've left you an example to follow, so do it. I've left you an example, so do it. Romans chapter 15, verses 8 and 9 goes so far as to say that Jesus became a bond servant to the Jews for the sake of the gospel. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7 clearly teaches that Jesus humbled himself, taking the form of a bond servant. Now, he's still deity. He's still Christ and Lord. But he took the form of a bond servant. He submitted to his spouse's needs. Not to her authority. Keep that in mind but he submitted to his bride's needs. We as the bride of Christ needed to be saved from our sins. We couldn't do it ourselves. Only Christ could do it. So let's make a point here along these lines. Submission does not mean you are wrong. It is neither an indication that you are wrong nor weak. And let's use a first century example to keep this in mind. Go to Romans chapter 14, if you will. If you'd like to follow along here. Now, this is definitely not in the context of marriage. So, with that being said, notice here the way that Paul talks about being subject to one another's needs. Being willing to submit to someone else's needs, even though you're not wrong and you're not weaker than that person. Romans 14, verses 1 through 3. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment as opinions. One man has faith that he, may, that he may eat all things. I think speaking more specifically of meat, excuse me, sacrifice to idols. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. He's weak in the sense that he's not sure if he should eat this or that. He doesn't have enough confidence to eat this or that. So just to be on the safe side, to make his conscience feel better, he just eats vegetables only, just in case he might be wrong about it. Let, him who eats regard, uh, let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. So when it comes to disputable matters of conduct, whether we eat meat sacrificed to idols, or we eat vegetables only, or those sorts of things, based on conscience or judgment, we have to recognize the importance of submission in our relationships. That I accept I accept that by your conscience or your judgment, you cannot eat that meat. And I'm going to live in such a way as to submit myself to your regard for that thing. And Paul, of course, would say back in the book of 1 Corinthians, that if it causes my brother to stumble, I'll never eat meat again. If that's what it takes to not cause my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. Now, would Paul have been wrong for eating meat? Of course not. He points out very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and in chapter 10, you're not wrong for eating meat. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not sinful. It's not wrong. But I would choose to submit to my brother or sister and never eat meat again if that's what it took to maintain unity in the body of Christ. Go back to Romans 14, and notice here a couple of passages in Romans 14 and verse 13. We'll bounce around a little bit here, but in Romans 14, verses 13 through 15, he says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in another's way. He goes on to say, If because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. If you thrust your will upon somebody else, you're not walking according to love. Now, you might not be wrong, but you certainly haven't built up the body of Christ. And you sacrificed unity for the sake of being right or getting your way. He says, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. So then, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. I love that. Now, that's talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols in a first century church context. I get that. I understand that. But the natural pattern in a lot of relationships is for the leader, quote unquote, the leader, to break the tie with his vote. To say, I'm the head of the household, so I get to say what goes here. And that attitude, I think, has to go back to Romans 14 or 1 Corinthians 8 or 10. 
It has to go back there that says, okay, I can either submit to your need or I can run you over with my need. I can either submit to what will make you built up stronger, happier, more faithful, or like a tank running over a compact car, I can just ram you, smash you to bits, and tell you what to do. Because it says it right there in the Bible that the husband is the head of the household, right? So we have this kind of attitude where we feel like as the head of the household, we're allowed to break every tie, make the decisions, say what we want, and say, well, yeah, God said it. It's right there on the page, so I'm allowed to do that. I'll give you an example in the context of marriage, and this one's going to hit close to home for a lot of people, I'm sure, and it may be a little bit uncomfortable for you, but Paul does not pull any punches here when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now in the typical drama of a marriage when one partner is less satisfied sexually than the other, what tends to happen is... It says it right there on the page. You have to do what makes me happy. The Bible says it right there. You have to do what I want you to do to make me happy. And if you don't, you're wrong. But when I look at a passage like this, I see two very different attitudes at play. On the one hand, you might take this passage and assume that what it's saying is, this verse is all about me and what makes me happy, and you have to do what makes me happy. Or the passage is saying, I have to do what makes you happy. I have to do what makes you happy. This passage isn't saying that the husband gets whatever he wants in a marriage. This passage is saying, husbands, make your wives happy. And wives, make your husbands happy. You don't have any control over what your spouse does. You have no control over that. That's not up for you to decide. What your wife's or your husband's responsibility is, is not up to you to decide. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is not meant to be used as a weapon to get what you want out of a marriage. 1 Corinthians 7 is used as a weapon against you when you have a bad attitude about marriage. It is God speaking through the Apostle Paul saying, Husbands, stop being selfish. And wives, stop being selfish. And if your spouse chooses to be selfish, that's on them. You don't get to decide that though. The only thing that we have control over in a marriage is how we respond to the stimulus, how we respond to the situation or the circumstances. That is all that you have control over in a marriage. In a book called Every Woman's Desire, the writer has this to say about submission, and I think it's a great way to sum up what we've talked about this morning together. A husband and a wife do submit to each other for different reasons, but the writer has this to say, our mutual submission, which I think is a great word to describe this, by the way, mutual submission, our mutual submission in marriage must deepen until it parallels the mutual submission found between Christ and His church. The wife must submit fully to her husband's authority as the church submits to Christ's authority out of reverence for God. The husband, however, must submit fully to oneness as Christ sacrificially submitted to the oneness with His bride. Thus, both husband and wife submit, but differently, for different reasons and with a similar outcome. The goal is oneness, isn't it? The goal is to be together. The goal is to fulfill what God has commanded of all of our marriages, to leave your father and mother and to cling to your spouse as if he or she was your own flesh. That's oneness in a marriage. 
And isn't oneness worth it? Ask yourself, is there really any habit or decision that I would not sacrifice if I knew that marital oneness was on the line? Is there really any choice that I would not compromise on if I knew that my options were encouraging my spouse or trampling my spouse? And in situations where conflicts arise, especially on matters of judgment or conscience, what are we willing to give up in order to love each other as Christ loved the church? Alan made a really good point on this subject recently in a Bible study. Talking about something that was told to him before he got married. It was your brother, I believe, who gave you a book to read on Jesus and the crucifixion experience. And Alan wondered why it was that that book had anything to do with marriage. And after reading it, his brother reminded him that Jesus died for his bride. He sacrificed all. He submitted himself. He came in the form of a bondservant and died a criminal's death. Totally submitted not to the bride's authority, but to the bride's needs, which were so desperate. We have to be reminded constantly that if Christ was willing to die for His bride, a horrible, horrible, excruciating death, and we might proclaim that boldly, I would die for my wife, I would die for my family. Okay, that's easy to say. Why is it so interesting then that we would proudly proclaim, I would die for my wife, but I'm not going to compromise on this little thing. I would die for my wife, but I'm not going to ease up when it comes to our checking account. I would die for my wife, but I'm going to trample her needs when it comes to sexual intimacy. I would die and sacrifice everything for my wife, but I won't compromise on the little things that really would build up oneness with my wife. Words are cheap, my friends. Words are cheap. Daily living and daily sacrifice for the needs of our spouse, that's a two-way street, and that's what really builds up a strong and healthy marriage. And I believe that's exactly how the Bible presents it. Now, if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to please let all your spiritual needs be known. Don't put off until tomorrow what needs to be done today. If you've listened to the gospel message and you know what it is that you need to do, then please obey. Whatever spiritual needs you might have, please let it be known and come forward as we stand and sing.